Great musicians have died in many ways over the years, but air travel has been particularly unkind to the world of music, and it seems like every decade at least one icon has died in an aviation accident. These are the musicians who were tragically killed in plane crashes. During the darkest days of World War II, many Americans relied on the music of Glenn Miller and his orchestra to lift their spirits. Rising to fame as the King of Swing in the late 1930s, Miller topped the charts with such classics as In the Mood and Pennsylvania 65000. By the early 1940s, the Glenn Miller Orchestra was the number one dance band in the United States. As the war raged on, however, Miller began to lose his band members to the draft. Then, in his late 30s and ineligible for the draft himself, the band leader decided to join the war effort on his own terms. Appealing directly to his connections in the U.S. military, Miller entered the Army to modernize its approach to military music. As leader of the U.S. Army Air Force Band, he also found himself utilizing his music as part of a counter-propaganda radio program. On December 15, 1944, Miller boarded a single-engine UC-64 and took off from England. On the way to Paris, which had been liberated by Allied forces that August, Miller was scheduled to make arrangements for moving his band to the French capital. But Miller's plane never arrived. Although the wreckage and bodies have never been recovered, it's likely that Miller's plane went down in icy conditions over the English Channel. Born in the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains in 1898, Grace Moore made an unlikely journey from East Tennessee to New York, going on to become one of the most beloved musical stars of the 1930s and 40s. Raised in a strict Baptist household, the starry-eyed singer yearned to leave her insular community for the bright lights of the Big Apple. Moore's pursuit of a musical education eventually led her to France, where she studied opera. In 1928, she made her debut at the Metropolitan Opera House. Dubbed the Tennessee Nightingale by the press, Moore became a worldwide musical phenomenon. Soon, the glamorous singer had become a star of the silver screen, too. Whilst on a sold-out tour of Europe in 1947, Moore boarded a twin-engine plane in Copenhagen, Denmark, bound for Stockholm, Sweden. The plane had barely lifted from the ground when it shuddered and nosedived into the ground killing all 22 of the plane's occupants, including Prince Gustav Adolf, the heir to Sweden's throne. February 3, 1959 is arguably the single most tragic day in rock and roll history. Memorialized as the day the music died, that snowy winter morning marks the date when a plane carrying superstar musicians Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper crashed shortly after takeoff. Frustrated with a mechanically unsound and freezing bus, Holly chartered a plane to take him and band members Tommy Alsup and Waylon Jennings from their winter dance party show in Iowa to their next tour date in Minnesota. Valens, who was nursing a cold, won Alsup's seat in a friendly coin toss. Jennings wound up giving his seat to the Big Bopper, who was sick with the flu and couldn't handle another ride on the frigid bus. When Holly found out that Jennings had given up his seat, he joked, I hope your old bus freezes up again, to which Jennings quipped, well, I hope your old plane crashes. The three musicians were killed when their plane crashed in a barren cornfield just outside of Mason City, Iowa. Although his statement had been made in jest, Waylon Jennings regretted his words for the rest of his life. When you feel like, you feel guilty about it, and everything, you know, you think, and find, try and find reasons that you might have caused it, you know. Few names in country music history are quite as famous as Patsy Cline's. Remembered for such powerful and haunting hits as Crazy, Walking After Midnight, and I Fall to Pieces, Cline was one of the first country stars to find success with a pop music audience. In 1961, just as her career was really kicking off, she was injured in a near-fatal car accident, and although Cline eventually recovered, her boisterous personality was tinged with a troubling fatalism as a result. Shortly afterwards, Klein gave her scrapbook to her friend, the up-and-coming country singer Dottie West, telling her, It ain't gonna to do me no good. I'll never live to see 30. On March 5, 1963, Klein and fellow country music stars Hawkshaw Hawkins and Cowboy Copas boarded a single-engine Piper aircraft piloted by Klein's manager, Randy Hughes. Departing from a brief stop at Dyersburg Municipal Airport in Tennessee, Hughes was anxious to get Klein and her co-passengers back to Nashville, despite warnings about the weather. Minutes after takeoff, 
Hughes, an inexperienced pilot without instrument training, inadvertently crashed the plane over a forested area near Camden, Tennessee, killing everybody on board. Just over a year after Patsy Cline's death, country music lost yet another iconic voice in a tragic plane crash. The Texas-born Jim Reeves was a pioneer of the sophisticated Nashville sound, which moved country music away from its rustic roots to a more polished, cosmopolitan vibe. He began his career in the 1950s with such hits as Mexican Joe and Bimbo. However, by the close of the decade, he had successfully reinvented himself as a smooth country balladeer. Like Klein, Reeves also found success in popular music. His hit singles Four Walls, He'll Have to Go, and Welcome to My World crossed genre lines thanks to Reeves' stirring, intimate delivery. On July 31, 1964, Reeves was at the controls of his single-engine Beechcraft Debonair, returning from Arkansas with his manager and piano player, Dean Manuel. Departing in clear weather, Reeves and Manuel expected a smooth flight back to Nashville. The country crooner soon reported he was flying into heavy rain, however, as he made his approach to the airport. At 4.48 p.m., Reeves' plane disappeared from radar. For two days, a team of 400 people, 12 planes, and two helicopters searched the area near Nashville's Barry Airport for any sign of Reeves and Manuel. On August 2, 1964, the plane's wreckage was found in the woods near Nashville, along with the bodies of its occupants. One of the most influential singers of the 1960s, Otis Redding crossed racial barriers to find success in both soul and pop music. Influenced by Sam Cooke and Little Richard, Redding began singing in church as a child, but his love of gospel music soon gave way to an obsession with blues and rock and roll. By the mid-1960s, Redding had released two best-selling albums of high-energy soul music. His third, Otis Blue, was a magnum opus recorded in a single 24-hour session. Composed largely of soulful cover songs, the album also featured Respect, which would become Aretha Franklin's signature song when she re-recorded it in 1967. Already a superstar of soul and R&B, Redding wanted to widen his appeal, and his 1967 performance at the Monterey Pop Festival was a career-defining moment. At last bringing his talents before an enthusiastic white audience, Redding was poised to become a true music legend. In December 1967, however, just before Redding released the song that would become his biggest hit, the singer and four members of the R&B group The Barkays died when their plane crashed into Wisconsin's Lake Monona. No satisfactory explanation for the accident has ever been determined. Redding, who scored his first number one hit a month later, was just 26 years old. Possessing a unique gift for combining storytelling with melody, Jim Croce created unforgettable characters that reflected the lives, the loves, and the anguish of common people. Croce, however, was no overnight success. Struggling to make music his livelihood, he took a succession of blue-collar jobs while playing clubs for as little as $25 per night. Everything changed for Croce in 1972, however, with the release of his first album, You Don't Mess Around with Jim. A string of hit singles from the album made Croce a superstar, but life on the road put a toll on his marriage. Fed up with the music business, Croce decided to concentrate on his family. After one more tour, he planned to leave the road for good. On September 20th, 1973, Croce played his final concert in Louisiana. After the show, he boarded a chartered Beechcraft aircraft bound for Texas. A subsequent investigation suggested that the pilot may have suffered a heart attack during takeoff. Whatever the reason, the plane failed to gain altitude and slammed into a row of trees. There were no survivors. Beloved by many as the greatest southern rock band of all time, Leonard Skinner was one of the biggest groups of the 1970s. Fronted by singer Ronnie Van Zandt, the band remade rock music in their own image with songs that reflected their whiskey-soaked, hell-raising lifestyle. Leonard Skinner rocked as hard as any supergroup of the decade with such hit singles as Gimme Back My Bullets and their signature tune Sweet Home Alabama, but they also displayed a soulful side with songs like Simple Man and the epic Freebird. In 1977, Leonard Skinner were at their peak, having just released their critically acclaimed album Street Survivors. The Southern Rockers were preparing for a triumphant tour that would finally put their tumultuous past of alcohol, drugs, and infighting behind them. On October 20, 1977, 
The band departed from a show in Greensville, South Carolina, making for Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Just short of its destination, however, their plane crashed in a heavily wooded swamp near Gillsburg, Mississippi. You can't even realize, seeing one of these things on television, exactly what a crash of this magnitude looks like. Final radio contact from the pilots indicated that the plane had run out of fuel. Among the dead were Van Zandt, guitarist Steve Gaines, and backup singer Cassie Gaines, as well as both pilots and the band's assistant road manager. Rick Nelson came of age as a squeaky clean boy next door alongside his real-life parents and siblings on the 1950s sitcom The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. A gifted musician, Nelson soon broke out from his TV career to become a rock and roll teen idol. As the 60s dawned, Nelson moved away from his 50s pop past and took a more down-home musical direction. In 1972, Nelson enjoyed renewed popularity thanks to his song Garden Party, a reflective acoustic number recounting his disastrous appearance at a Madison Square Garden oldies revival show. Nelson at last embraced his teen idol past and embarked on a nostalgia tour in 1985. His final bid at a comeback was short-lived though, as Nelson was killed when his chartered DC-3 caught fire over Texas on New Year's Day, 1986. Nelson's fiance and band also perished in the burning wreckage. Only the pilots survived, having successfully landed the burning aircraft in a field after attempting to land on a road. Something happened, either some cars got in the way or something, and they elected to go to a field, and uh, it appeared to me that they probably hit into some trees. A faulty heater was the suspected cause of the accident, but a National Transportation Safety Board investigation was unable to find the source of the fire. In the 1990s, at just 15 years old, Aaliyah rose to stardom as a pop and hip-hop sensation. By the turn of the millennium, she was R&B royalty. In August 2001, Aaliyah had just finished shooting a video for her upcoming single, Rock the Boat, from her self-titled third album on location in the Bahamas. The singer and her entourage had chartered a twin-engine Cessna for their return flight to the States. Slightly smaller than the plane they arrived in, the aircraft nevertheless seemed large enough to accommodate Aaliyah's crew and their luggage. Over the protestations of the pilot and baggage handler, the wary passengers insisted on taking off despite the plane being overloaded by hundreds of pounds. According to eyewitnesses, the plane rose to an altitude of 60 to 100 feet before violently pitching forward and crashing 200 feet from the runway. All nine passengers died, including Aaliyah, who was just 22 years old. <laughs>